Father, I ask that you come by your Holy Spirit into each one of us now, that you raise in us our thinking into your thinking, our understanding into your understanding, and our hearts to leap for your purpose in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we asked the same question in a way that we're going to be asking this week. Uh, what is a proper Christian response when the world around us turns upside down, when all is new, different, chaos, painful? We cannot rely any longer on the what we know or the what we can count on or the what we can anticipate. And surprisingly to me, what, what we looked at last week was the first thing that we saw Jesus doing in that situation was to enter into the fullness of whatever those around him were encountering. So if it was poverty, he entered into that poverty. If it was illness, he came alongside that illness. Uh, if it was, uh, as we looked at last week, the death of Lazarus, if it was grief and bereavement, then he joined with that in its fullness. And he did nothing until he placed himself in the same place as those around him, as those who were grieving, who were suffering in some way or another, who were disadvantaged. So step one was to join with them together, to be one with them. And now today we're going to look at step two. Now these, these two things, and, and there are some incidental things that I've been reminded of, but both of them are kind of ahas to me. Uh, this is the fruit of the study that I've been doing for the last month or so trying to figure out what have Christians done historically in the past in such situations? What should we be doing now? How should we see this, perceive this, think about this, uh, speak of it to others? What, in what way can we follow God's lead and guidance in this period of time? And now there are lots of little things that I won't talk about, but the second big aha to me uh, is what we're gonna see today. Pandemics are not new. Uh, if you wanna call them viral pandemics or whatever, but cataclysmic events have been around since the beginning of the earth. Cavemen experienced uh, them. They, fires that burn through uh, their habitats, or earthquakes, meteors, volcanoes, hurricanes, uh, tsunamis, uh, and pandemics and plagues are just another form of that, perhaps which don't just come upon us, but actually which we have the, uh, the, the, necessity to look after one another because we can give it to one another. Uh, but like droughts and, and other things, they've, they've been around for a long time. Uh, and I've just come across some study, some medical study about this sort of situation, disasters of one sort or another. And there's actually been quite a bit written at the moment, the most, uh, telling an advanced uh, book is written by Zunin and Myers, and it's called Phases of a Disaster Framework. And you can get copies online if you want. And what they have discovered in all of their study is that um, disasters come in six stages by and large. It doesn't matter which of those kinds of disasters, they have the similar similarities in these six stages. There's the pre-disaster phase in which life is normal and everybody is eating, drinking, and being merry in whatever fashion they're suitably employed and life is, is good or bad. Uh, and then there is the impact phase. 
in which the disaster hits. And there's confusion and, and they describe all of the, the, the things that come along with the impact. And it obviously differs on the nature of the disaster. Then there's the heroic phase uh, in which people rise above it. Uh, people help one another. This is where we stand out and clap uh, the medical uh, people who are uh, the doctors and nurses and the uh, care attendants and so forth. Who, who have risen above their own danger and, and seek to help one another. Then there is the honeymoon phase uh, in which we seem to be on top of it. It seems to be getting better. Uh, whatever has been terrible, the, 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 the shaking from the earthquake has subsided uh, and, and, and we've made the rescues that needed to be made. I, I, uh, uh, got a, uh, an email from one of my sons this morning uh, from a university in the UK uh, in which uh, a, a large window in the student digs said, um, uh, uh, danger pandemic, send help, sorry, uh, need help, send beer. Now, I'm not quite sure whether that's the, um, uh, the heroic phase or the honeymoon phase. Uh, but, but immediately following the heroic phase and the honeymoon phase of it comes the disillusionment phase. And um, there've been a number of articles recently on the fact that in the last few weeks, we have come into the disillusionment phase. Now the disillusionment phase is eventually followed by the last one, which is the reconstruction phase, but we haven't got there yet. And the, the disillusionment phase is a, what I would call the forever phase. It, this is the point where suddenly um, the sprint becomes a marathon. You suddenly get over the top of the crest of the hill and discover that you're at the foothills of a much bigger mountain. Uh, this is the uh, depression phase that's marked by depression and anxiety and substance abuse. Uh, by the disruption of all our habits, the, the sudden fear that we'll, life will never get back to any form of normality again, that, oh my goodness, uh, it's not going to be over at the end of the summer. It's not going to be over at Christmas. And it may not even be over until next summer or even until there's a vaccine, if there ever is a vaccine. It's where the disruption of our habits there, it's it's uh, seen by as with a lot of political polarization. People begin to fight amongst themselves politically and in other ways and disagree. It's a there becomes a searching for existential answers. Um, what is really the meaning of life in the midst of this sort of thing? What what can I do? Who am I? Um, what does all of this signify? There's a search for meaning and purpose and destiny and control and our roles in life. And we've, we've hit that. Uh, there's no, no doubt. The Bible sees a lot of this and speaks a lot of it, but it's interesting. And this is something that I was reminded of. There are, there are different ways of seeing things in the Bible. And we need to recognize that Old Testament phase and New Testament phase are very different. Not because people wrote them at different times, but because God changed the purpose of life and situations uh, at various stages of, of biblical history. And so in the Old Testament, and, and of course the first uh, universal disaster in first, was a flood, uh, but you can follow this through uh, the history of the of the people of Israel, uh, God's special chosen people. And there were times, the exile being an example of one of them where disaster hit and suddenly their entire world is, is, is turned upside down. And questions are asked and often in the anticipation of this, call it the pre-disaster phase, if you wanna call it that, God says warnings. He says, if you don't change the way you operate and you live, 
uh, then this is what's going to happen. This is the consequence. Uh, there are situations, the plagues in Egypt, when Moses left, for instance, pre-disaster phase, God sent those plagues in order to enable them to leave Egypt and to come out. They weren't actually designed to destroy them, but rather to produce separation from an unhealthy situation. So God sometimes controls these things. But in the Old uh, Testament, the signs that were signs of God's power and authority and his desire to bless his people and call them back to who they are and what they were called to do are different. When we get into the New Testament, the focus is entirely on Christ. The people of the, uh, uh, the Pharisees of that time uh, asked for signs. They said, are you bringing a sign? Have you got a sign for us? And Jesus said, uh, the only sign you're going to get is the, is the sign of Jonah, which is basically three days in the belly of a whale, three days in the tomb. Paul takes us up uh, later on uh, in some of his letters and explains that in more, in more detail that Jesus, uh, that there will be no more signs. Jesus is the sign. The, there will be disasters and all sorts of things, but they are not signs from God to warn people. The warning came in Jesus and the opportunity comes in Jesus. No longer do we have to behave ourselves properly in order to be right with God. What we have to do is accept the sign of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and we will be accepted by God. And so everything changes at that moment. So those who at this stage of, of the pandemic, and there are, there are some, perhaps many, uh, who are in churches and are saying, this is a sign of the end times. It is not. We are told specifically that no one knows when the end times are. And it is not a sign saying, behave yourselves, turn from your wicked ways or God will destroy you. It is not. Now that may be a consequence of our, of our actions, but the sign and the invitation is Christ himself. And in these days, the Christ himself uh, is represented by us as Christians, that we are the ones who carry that sign out to others. The sign is not in earthquakes and the sign is not in pandemics and is not in various physical activities or disasters or, or miracles or in the skies or whatever. It is in us. So that's, that's the background we need to take into this. And let me reference our first lesson, where in order to be that kind of a sign to others, we need to know, and Paul tells us this in his book to the Romans, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, he says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, more than conquerors. In other words, we, we are in fact the signs. We don't just rise above it, but we are the sign for others of life, of eternal life. We are the ones who bring that life to others. We are the ones who offer Christ to those around us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels or demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, we are not only that, but what have we got to lose? Because none of this stuff is important to us. What's important is our role that God has given us. What is important is our ability to reach out with his love to others. The pandemic doesn't matter. If we die of the pandemic, we know where we're going. And there, this is not a call to foolishness, but it, we need the social distancing and the masks and all the other things. But it is a call to not operate in fear at this time 
but to remind ourselves what God is calling us to do and to be. Let me move on to our first lesson, uh, sorry, our second lesson. And in this, uh, John tells us, uh, uh, recounts a situation where, where um, uh, James and uh, uh, John are together uh, with, with, and Jesus appears to them. And he says, again, Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. This is at the, this is at the height of the disillusionment phase for the disciples. They're, they've hit impact. Christ has died. They're in the immediate aftermath of that. They're completely bewildered. They have no idea what's going on around them. They're just stunned. And he says, peace. Chill, relax. The fullness of how Christ has made you come to you, shalom. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The blessing that God has given me in you, he is going to give you in others. Even as I have come here to bring this message and to be this sign for you and for others here now, you will be that for others to come, he says. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I'm now giving you what you need to do that. God's spirit residing in you will give you everything you need to go out and to be me for them. If you forgive everyone, anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you've not forgiven them, they're not forgiven. In other words, you not only have the power, but you have the authority. Only God in their, in their faith, in their understanding of faith at the time, had the power, had the authority to forgive sins. So I've not only given you the power, but I've given you the authority to do that. You have the power and the authority. Later on, uh, we, we see that uh, in the book of Matthew, he says, all power and authority has been given to me, and I am therefore sending you. He gives them that power and that authority. Now, I want to look at what happens then, uh, because the disciples then go out and they do that. They tell others, they become Jesus to others. Uh, and they begin to have an impact on the world. Hence, we are here today. Let me just deviate for a moment, uh, a, a little into slightly more modern times. Still biblically, in Antioch, the there was a plague that hit Antioch in AD 46 to 54. And the people, and the, and, and, the, and the Bible tells us this, the people who, who were affected by that plague asked three questions. When that hit, and when they got into the disillusionment phase, after the impact phase, what they said was, who will, the questions they asked were, they were not to question why. Why is this happening to us? Why um, are we... What have we done wrong? Why, 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 why is, is this impacting? They did not ask that question. They asked is, firstly, who will be most at risk? They asked. Secondly, how can we help? How can we help? And thirdly, who shall we send? Who shall we send to be our representative in this help? Those are the three questions they asked in Antioch. Rodney Stark, in his very famous and well-accepted book of, of uh, The Rise of Christianity, which is foundational, we read it in, in theological colleges and so forth now, says that the way the early Christians behaved was a significant factor in contributing to the spread of the gospel and the early Christian faith. In other words, how they operated spread the gospel how they loved. They didn't even have to 
to say, to speak the gospel, people sat there and said, how these Christians love each other. Why are they ministering to us? How can they do this? Why are they seeking to help when everybody else is running away? Everyone else is hiding out. Everyone else is blaming each other. Everyone else is looking for personal advantage. And these Christians don't do that. They're trying to help. Marcus Aurelius in, in 170 AD, when there was a, a plague in Rome, spoke of that and wrote about that and said, it's the Christians. Uh, he didn't say that very favorably, but it's the Christians who are responding properly to this. In 250, Rome was almost decimated, not decimated, it was almost cleared out because those who could left and those who couldn't died in Rome from a plague. It was the Christians who stayed. Julian in 330, trying to rid the world uh, of Christianity after, uh, after um, uh, Constantine, wrote that he, he couldn't manage to rid uh, the Roman Empire of Christians because people wouldn't help him with that because the Christians were so essential to the care of the poor and the sick. Now, uh, I have personal experience with that because um, I uh, became responsible for all the Christians in Oman, except for the Catholics, uh, for several years. And my position as the senior pastor of the Protestant Church in Oman, which included all the Orthodox and it included more than 40 denominations, my position existed because the Sultan created my position and he created our position because he had experienced the, the Anglican faith when he studied at Oxford and he lived in a vicar's home for four years. He, uh, he first went to Sandhurst and then he went to Oxford and he saw the Christians and how they operated in Oxford. And he said, this is a good thing. Um, and in the late 1800s, the Reformed Church of America had seeded the entire Middle East area with hospitals, including Oman. And that was the medical care that was available throughout the country up until about 19, late 1970s. That was all the medical care there was other than native healers. And it was the behavior of Christians that spread Christianity uh, to the extent it did in the Muslim world. So let me just conclude but by saying I hope that you recognize, this is, a, this is good news to us as All Saints. When I came here, I recognized that this was a church that knew how to give itself, more than I've ever seen in a church. We are a church that sees the world around us. We are not just an expatriate enclave isolated, but we're constantly seeking to share um, ourselves with others. And so there's charitable operation after charitable operation. We, we meet together, we make things, we sell things, we give money, we support things, we, we, we attend things, we, we, we build things, and have been doing it long, long before I arrived here. And, and it is very good. We look around and say, where can we help? And we are good at this. This is how God's made us. This is what we are made to be. This is, God has prepared us for such a time as this. This is not seed planting time. This is not plowing the furrows time. This is harvest time. This is to put into time to put into practice what God has already put into us. And so let me suggest some things for us in this time of pandemic. Firstly, we need to pray. We need to keep our eyes open and see what, who is suffering. We need to say who are most at risk around us. And we need to pray for them. We need to ask God to relieve their suffering, their risk, the, their problems. 
that may be poverty, it may be economic, it may be physical and health, uh, it may be all sorts of things. And God will show us if we ask him. Secondly, we need to ask not why, why is this happening? But we need to ask what needs to be done as they did in Antioch, what needs to be done? Who is at risk? How can we help? Who should we send? And we need to organize ourselves to do this. And we need to do it, thirdly, together. This isn't just an individual task. So this is the time for Alpha, where we can offer a relief and a pressure valve for those who are trying to figure out what the world, world is like now. It is also time for small groups, your virtual home group or your home group, um, for doing things together. It is the time that those getting together to do craft works need to be talking about this and saying, what more can we do? Who is at risk? How can we help? What, what sorts of things can we aim, me, us, the church, perhaps even more broadly, at? And we need to be the comfort for the others. We need to say to them, I know where I am going. So this pandemic is not a threat to my eternal life. In all these things, we are completely victorious through the one who loved us, Romans 8, 37 to 39, through the one who loved us. I am persuaded you see that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor the present, nor the future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.